the overview of Acts chapter 7, and I'm not even going to repeat where Stephen's heading. We're just going to try to get there, because <laughs> he's taken a long time to get there, and we'll, we've already kind of showed an overview, because it's such a, a long message, and, uh, and then I reminded you last week when we studied again what his points were, what, uh, but I think we just want to get right into the verses themselves. So go to Acts chapter 7, and I'm just going to point out to you in verses uh, 5 through 7 here, there's a prophecy made. There's, as you're going through Acts 7, and what, what we're coming to is a conclusion, this is the third go-around with the leadership of the nation of Israel who is opposing what Jesus Christ is now accomplishing through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the Apostles. Stephen stands up and gives his defense before this council, and when he does, he just goes he just goes all the way back to Abraham and starts working his way forward. And at first you think, well, if he keeps on this pace, he's going to rewrite the Old Testament because he's got so much detail going. But as you study it, you begin to see he starts out with Abraham, then he jumps to Joseph, then he's going to jump to Moses, and then immediately he's going to come to Jesus Christ. He's just barely going to mention David and Solomon and Joshua, uh, but his point will be to quickly get to the Lord Jesus Christ because there's something that connects those. And one of the things that we've seen here is that there's a, a reference all the time to a second. He's pointing out in Israel's history that the first time God goes to bring deliverance to the nation of Israel, they, they reject him. There's a rejection, a disobedience, and then... Then after a, another, uh, a time of judgment, a time of discomfort, a uh, time of wandering in the wilderness, so to speak, then the second time comes the fulfillment of God's promise. And, uh, and, and so in verse 5 it says this, um, speaking about to Abraham, and we're, we're going to not talk about the two things that fulfilled in Abraham's life, but it says in verse 5, he gave him none inheritance in it. That is, he gave, God did not give Abraham an inheritance in the land in his lifetime. No, not so much to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him when as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise that his seed should sojourn in a strange land and that he should bring them, that they, uh, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, saith God, and after that shall, he, shall they come forth and serve me in this place. Now the reason I'm reading that is, first of all, you get the idea that Abraham, God, he went into a land, but he never inherited, although God promised it. So that means that the inheritance is yet future. There's still a time in which Abraham's going to inherit that land. It's not the first time, it's the next time he comes, and that'll be in resurrection. But then, after he makes this promise to Abraham, he promises two things there in verses 5 through 7. That he would give Abraham a seed and multiply that seed, and eventually it would, be, it would multiply in a strange land. Then the second, so the seed would multiply from Abraham. The second part of the promise is that then after they multiplied, he would bring them out of that strange land and bring them to the land that he had promised them. Well, last week we got looking at verses seven through uh, no, actually verse eight through sixteen, and realized he's that's really a, the first part of the promise, the the fulfillment of the seed. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac Jacob, Jacob, uh, the the patriarchs, the twelve uh, uh, sons of Abraham, of of Jacob, which are the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, and then how through Joseph, who is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ that uh, they finally multiplied in Egypt. And there we go through a process there where we were looking at Joseph as a type of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first time that they came to Egypt for, for uh, provision, for salvation from the drought that, that existed in their day, uh, they didn't know who Joseph was because they had sold him and so forth. We talked about it last week. Verse 13 says, At the second time Joseph was made known. And so... The seed was multiplied. The, that was fulfilled. In verse 17, where we're going to pick up now, there's a sense in which in verses 17 all the way through 37, the second part of that prophecy in verses 5 through 7 is going to be fulfilled. 
He's already, he's, by verse 16, he's fulfilled the prophecy of multiplying the seed in Egypt. The second part of that prophecy is that that seed is going to be delivered from Egypt and to the promised land. Now, now watch this just, be, just to prepare you. There's a sense in which I'm thinking <laughs> that there's just so much material here that it's going to be hard to express the, all the little thing, fine points that I see, I see jumping up here as if there's not a real smooth continuity. Uh, but maybe, maybe, it, maybe it'll come out better where you'll see the continuity. Uh, I'll, I'll jump ahead at different times to show you that. It, for instance, in chapter uh, 7, verse 17, it says, And when the time of the promise drew near, nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. Now, see, the reason I, I, I read verses 5 through 7 what promise is he talking about there? Well, the promise he made there in verses 5 through 7 to Abraham, that his seed would multiply in Egypt, and then it would come time for them to come out of Egypt into the promised land. So he's, he's, he's drawn your attention to that, and now he's going to show that now they're multiplied, and now they're going to come out of that land. But what's interesting in that is in verse 17 all the way through 37 is going to be a story of how they came out of Egypt. And then he's just going to all of a sudden abruptly end and bring it right up to the Lord Jesus Christ. Going to go back just a little bit to show how they finally entered into the land under Joshua and then under David and Solomon, the kingdom was established and immediately he's going to go show that, that they, Israel went into apostasy. He, he, he goes through all this information just to lead up to Moses leading Israel out of the wilderness, into the wilderness, but remember what the prophecy is? That they would inherit the land, right? They don't, you, don't see them in, you, you don't see them going into the land until you look at verse, uh, um, verse 45. Which also our fathers that came out after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, that is Joshua. It's verse 45 that they finally enter into the land. He's going through all this detail... And even from verses 17 through 37, all, all you get so far historically is that Moses led them out of Egypt. But they didn't make it to the land. In fact, he's going to show the apostasy of them in the wilderness and tie that in, the apostasy in the wilderness. He's going to tie it in with the apostasy under David and Sol- or after the days of David and Solomon in the days that God judged Israel through Babylon. In fact, if you look at the chart, you'll see it there, is you see... We're going to start, you know, looking at 17 through 37. We're going to take Moses. is going to go out in the wilderness. And all of a sudden, as soon as you get to verse 37, he's going to jump from Moses in the wilderness to the Lord Jesus Christ and the rejection of Christ. Going to jump back and, and, and skip, take the, all this information in a very short few verses and go to how Israel fell under Babylon, a political fall of Israel, kicked back off the land, Barely gets them in the land and immediately talks about how they're kicked off the land. And then jumps all that time and comes back to what Stephen's dealing with right there. It's related to the time of apostasy under the kings, the time of apostasy in the wilderness. Stephen says that's the same thing going on right now under, under the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the nation of Israel. He says, as your fathers resisted, so do ye. So these two events, that apostasy in the wilderness and the apostasy in the days of the kings, is what Stephen is, is pointing to and, and working his way to and, and draws. And, and the, uh, the other information in between, he just, he'll just jump big gaps of time. So let's go back and, and look closely at the time that he does give us information and see what we can glean from it. Back in verse, seven, in verse 17, again it says, And when the time was come... When the time was come that the promise drew nigh, God had swore to Ab- which God had swore to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king rose, which knew not Joseph. The same dwelt subtly uh, with, with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their, your, uh, their young children to the end they might not live, in which time Moses was born. And was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. 
And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Now, so you start out with, uh, when it comes time to deliver Israel from Egypt, naturally Moses is going to be the great deliverer. So the attention is given to Moses. And, and when you start out, you got this information about, uh, about Moses immediately when he was born. And when you look at that, it's interesting how twice in verse uh, 20 and verse 21, Moses is raised up or nourished up. Did you see that? In which time Moses, verse 20, was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him, up, uh, nourished him for her own son. So Moses himself is nourished twice. And it just, you know, I told you, I keep seeing a twice, two things going on here. He's nourished up, cast out, and nourished up again. And the second time he's nourished up as, as a king because he's now going to be raised as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And, and, and so anyhow, the whole point is to talk about Moses the deliverer. Now, in verse uh, 22, it says, and Moses... It says, and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in word and deed. And when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit the children, of, uh, visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him and was, uh, and was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. And he supposed his for he supposed that his brethren would understand how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he drew near, uh, he, he, uh, he, he, next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do you wrong one another? But, but he that did the, his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler? And a judge over us. Will thou kill me as thou did the Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses fled at the saying of, uh, at the at this saying, and was in a uh, in a strange land of Midian, Midian, where he was, uh, where he brought, where he begot two sons. So, you know, as you go through this, there's no need for us. In fact, we'd have to go study the book of Exodus the beginning chapters where all these details about Moses' birth, about how Moses grew up in, as a son to Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, there's more detail as you go back in the book of Exodus to get all that. But, you know, there's a sense in which you, you realize Stephen standing before a Jewish group of people, they, they, they know Moses. They know the life of Moses. He doesn't, have to, he doesn't have to say, you know, do you remember this? He's just going through it real simply so that the things that he's saying will click in their mind so he can make the point that he's going to make later. You and I, we got to make sure that we're familiar enough with the Bible, and I don't know where you are and, and how much you've studied and how much you've read like the book of Exodus, but you can see from here you're expected to know some things about the book of Exodus. If you didn't get it, you really have enough here already illustrated that Moses, he was there was a time in which they were killing the babies actually to prevent Israel from outnumbering the Egyptians because they're in Egypt and because Israel, God promised to multiply the seed. Well, if God is keeping his promise and Pharaoh is worried that Israel, if they keep being multiplied, there's going to be more Israelis in Egypt than Egyptians. So not only did they enslave them and put them to work for their cause, but they also started killing the Egyptian bo baby boys so that they would limit the, the number of, of, of Israel, of the Jews, in their land. And that's where Moses, his parents, you know, hit him for three months, uh, actually raised him three months and then hit him in the thickets and Pharaoh's daughter found him and then naturally she brings the baby home. Dad's going to let one Jewish little boy live. But the point of that is, as Moses grows up, in the palace of Egypt, there comes a certain time, and especially that, that statement there um, in verse 23. And when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Now, first of all, it's interesting, Moses' life is broken down into three 40-year periods. Two of the 40-year periods are going to be covered by, by uh, Stephen in, in what he's going through about Moses. 
But when he talks about this, this time here, it entered into his heart. See, when, he, when Moses grew up in the wisdom of the Egyptians, he also grew up in the understanding of God's program for the nation of Israel. He understood what, what a Jewish person, who the Jews were, why they were in Egypt. This promise that we read in verses 5 through 7, he knew these things. Don't forget, Moses, somewhere along, along the line, whether he, before he delivered Israel or when he first 40 years in the wilderness, um, some, may, some make it after he delivered Israel, that he wrote the book of Genesis. Uh, and, but the, re, the purpose of writing the book of Genesis is to remind the Jewish people who they are, what God's purpose for the nation of Israel is. Well, Moses, he knows these things. And, and, and when it says there, you know, he, he goes and he protects from the mistreatment of an of Egyptian. He actually kills an Egyptian to save a Hebrew. The next day, as he then tries to tell the Hebrews, why don't you guys get along? They turn around and say, why, are you going to kill me like you did the Egyptian yesterday? Well, he thought no one knew about the killing of the Egyptian, and now his own brethren are going to turn him in. And so he has to leave, he has to flee out of there. But the point of that is verse 25. It's a, I'll read verse 24. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him, uh, that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian, for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. The first time when Moses grew up and came to a place in his life where he could actually be used of God to deliver Israel from Egypt, from the slavery to Egypt, from the land of Egypt, and deliver them to the land that God had promised them, when he starts siding with his people, his own people don't see the hand of God in the, in the preserving of Moses. Moses saw it, but his own people didn't see it. So he ends up having to flee because of that. Now down in verse uh, 30, it says, now this will be the second 40 years. And it says, when 40 years were expired, so he fl- fled into the land of Midian got married there, had two sons. Uh, It says, And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in in a bush. And Moses saw it, uh, when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came, came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then, then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes uh, from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, uh, I have seen, and then it repeats, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groanings, and am come down to deliver them, and now I am sent, uh, I will send thee to Egypt. For this Moses, to whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared unto him in the bush. So you you get the point there. The first time he goes, they don't see it. The second time, he is going to actually achieve it. He's going to come back the second time and deliver them. You know, as you see that... um, As, as God appears to Moses, I forget the couple, verse 34, you know, I keep seeing the double. Isn't that strange? I have seen, I have seen the affliction of thy people, of my people. You know, when I read that, I'm thinking, you know, does the Lord stutter? <laughs> why would the Lord, why would the Lord say it twice? I mean, it's written here, not because the scribe started to write it and stopped and said, oh, I got to start writing that sentence again. It, there's a reminder, I've seen. Pause a little bit. I have seen the affliction of my people. God, God has been seeing. The, the, the nation of Israel, they rejected Moses the first time. It's now 40 years later, which is interesting, isn't it? Because they would not recognize the promise that who they are, what God said to Abraham, it came time for the promise to be fulfilled. God miraculously delivered a Hebrew raised in the palace of Egypt. Moses sees the hand of God in it. 
The Hebrews don't see the hand of God in it. And because they didn't see the hand of God, they're going to suffer 40 more years. That, what he says there in that statement, I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people. He, he's seen it twice. He's seen it when he raised up Moses. Then he had to look on it 40 more years because the people rejected Moses. And now he's sending Moses back. And, and, and then that's that point there uh, in verse, uh, thir- uh, verse 35. Oh, no. Where is that? Oh, yeah, verse 35. This Moses, this Moses whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler uh, and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared unto him in the bush. So the one they rejected, back there in verse 27, who made thee a ruler and a judge over us, God made him a ruler and a judge, actually a ruler and a deliverer. And, and so, what the, the, I mean, they, they actually prophesied what God was using Moses for. Verse 36, it says, And he brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. So he finally, he's going to bring them out. That, but the promise is that he's going to bring them into the land. Now there's going to be a problem getting into the land because even after they had to suffer 40 years before they could finally come out of the land, they're going to suffer 40 more years in the wilderness and not go into the land, that generation, because of their apostasy. And, uh, and, and we're, we're going to tie that in in a moment. Uh, uh, I want to take verse 36 there for a moment and, and just stop and think about some things. The, uh, that statement there, and he brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. Now think about, if you've been with us from the very beginning, and not this chart, if you've been with us from the very beginning of the book of Acts, when God has, Jesus Christ has ascended back into heaven and poured out the Holy Spirit The book of Acts is a second opportunity for the nation of Israel to receive the kingdom. They rejected Jesus Christ. As a result of that, there's there's going to be tribulation. I keep on, well, there's wrath there. They're They're going to face tribulation. And then Jesus Christ is going to come back and save them the second time. But the coming of the Holy Spirit in the beginning part of the book of Acts is another offer to the nation of Israel for them to wake up that when Jesus Christ showed up the first time and they didn't recognize him, get ready, he's going to come back a second time, and if you've received him, you'll, he'll receive you into the kingdom. And, and Stephen here, the thing that, that's being proved all the way through the book of Acts, that Jesus Christ is really giving, legitimately offering Israel another opportunity, is there's all kinds of signs and wonders going on. The miracles that Jesus Christ did in his earthly ministry to prove that he was of God, that he was their Savior, that he was their Deliverer, that he was their Messiah, those same miracles now are being done by the apostles that he appointed to serve in his absence, showing Israel there's another opportunity. Now think of that because verse 36, he he brought them out after that he showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt. Do you know why Stephen's been put on the carpet here? In fact, let's, let's go back even before Stephen. Go back to Acts chapter 2. Now, this first one, the Lord Jesus Christ, whether this is one of those things that Stephen's got, this will come up later, so I'll just read it now. And I'll, re- I'll think of, I'll remind it, remember to remind you later. But the first time you read about wonders and signs in the book of Acts is verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 19, where Jesus, where we're not Jesus Christ, Peter is quoting Joel about the events that they're seeing, and so they're already seeing some signs, but the sign is the fulfillment of God pouring out the Holy Spirit upon the nation of Israel, and verse 19 of the events that they're going to see is a future event yet to be seen, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, shall be saved. So there's yet future signs and wonders, right, coming. But as this is going on, you get down to verse 43. Acts chapter 2, verse 43. 
And I'll start, you know, this Peter finishes his message, and then verse 42 it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in fellowship, and a breaking of bread, and prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Now this is just happening consistently in the book of Acts, signs and wonders. For Stephen to stand up and start preaching here about Moses delivered Israel back here with signs and wonders, it ought to click that, you know, we've been seeing an awful lot of signs and wonders around here. (laughs) Come over to chapter uh, uh, 4, verse 30. And this is the apostles prayed after they've been beaten by the council. And, and they prayed and said, By stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Now that's important. The signs and wonders that the apostles are doing, they're acknowledging in prayer to God that that is your, that's God's hand. That is through Jesus Christ these signs and wonders are being done. They're, they're actually doing the signs and wonders in the name of Jesus Christ to show Israel that the one that you crucified is the one who's willing to save you yet. And the signs and wonders point to, to Christ. Uh, chapter 5 and verse 12. And it says, By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with the... Uh, uh, with, uh, with one accord in Solomon's porch. So you got the signs being done there. And then you come to chapter 7 and verse 36, where Stephen is talking about Moses. And he brought them up, brought them out. After that, he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. So that statement there, they ought to equate, hey, we're seeing the same thing that Moses. And by the way, I'm not sure you're aware of this, the first time the word signs shows up in your Bible is when Moses said, back to the verses that Jim was talking about, when God's sending Moses there, Moses says, well, who, who shall I say sent me? And God said, I am that I am. Tell them I am sent you. And then he said, well, they won't believe me. And so God gives Moses three signs to prove that when he gets there and they don't believe that you're from me, do these three signs to verify that he is of God, that he's speaking the word of God. That's the first time signs show up in your Bible, which is a pattern then that the purpose of signs in your Bible is to verify the word that the person's speaking. So here's the apostles and them telling them that that Jesus Christ, that even though they killed him, God raised him from the dead, and now he's poured out the Holy Spirit, and whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And they're giving Israel another opportunity, and they're seeing the same signs and wonders that Moses did. Delivering Israel. Now, they got to be careful. They're not going to be like Israel in the wilderness who never made it into the land. Because Stephen's going to talk to some group of people here that if they reject his message, they're not going to go into the kingdom. You see the relationship. You you see that's his point, where he's getting to. Uh, You know, another interesting thing, I just throw this out on the side. After Acts 7, verse 36, there's only one more time that, and I mean by using the two words together, Wonders and signs is used again in the book of Acts. Come over to Acts chapter 14. Paul, and we're jumping way ahead of ourselves here. You understand that. But if you understand anything in your Bible, God's going to interrupt his dealings with Israel. And rather bringing this wrath on this world, something that's not on this chart is the age of grace. And what's going to happen in the book of Acts is God's going to save Saul of Tarsus and make him Paul the apostle to the Gentiles and send grace to the world rather than wrath. And he can do that because of the, the purpose, the, the provision that Jesus Christ made in the cross. The cross became the means by which God could deal with the world in grace rather than in wrath and give this whole world, not just Israel but all nations, an opportunity to repent, to change their mind, trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, and have the gift of eternal life. Well, Paul, in his, in his uh, first ministry, as he's going out, he sa- it says in Acts chapter 14, verse 1, and it, came to pa- uh, and, and it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and spake that a great multitude, both Jews and also Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time, therefore, abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony to the word of his grace 
and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Now, why would God, after he's given these signs and wonders to Israel and they reject the message, why would God give Paul and Barnabas signs and wonders among us Gentiles? Well, you could say believing Jews, but the point is, how would you know that Paul is the apostle of the Gentile, just because he said he is? See, 2 Corinthians 12, Paul says, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. Paul, when Paul went out, he didn't come behind any gift of the apostles. God gave him the verification that when he went out and said, I'm going to show you a mystery that God never revealed before, that he indeed is speaking of God. And, uh, and it's interesting that after you look at all these signs and wonders, is, there's a point in Acts chapter 7 that Israel is going to fall. There's going to be an indictment against them. Next time signs and wonders are used in the book of Acts, it's us, God's turn to us Gentiles. Turn from Israel to the Gentiles. Go back to Acts 7. Now, now, here, you've got all this detail, and then you come to verse 37. Now, you've got Moses delivering Israel, and then verse 37, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. I had to keep looking at that. This is he. Is he going back to the Lord, or is he going back to Moses? <laughs> And as you read through the verse, he's talking about Moses. He's going back to Moses. In verse 37, this is that Moses which said. And then verse 38, this is he which was in the, in the church in the wilderness with the angel that spake to him in Mount Sinai. See, that's Moses. And with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us to whom our fathers would not obey but thrust him from them and in their hearts turned back again to Egypt. So, all of a sudden, he's going to go to the apostasy that took place in the wilderness. But before I get down to verse 39, just looking at verses 37 and 38, when, verse thir when, when he says in verse 37, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. Who's he talking about? Yeah, go back, go back, because there's another... If you read a little bit more, he could have actually got a little stronger with them. Go back to Deuteronomy 18. You might put a piece of paper in Deuteronomy 18. I don't know if we'll look at a couple other verses back here, if we'll get there or not. Now, this is Moses now. In Deuteronomy, he's actually speaking... Not to that generation that died in the wilderness, but to the next generation who's going to go into the land and, uh, and be blessed, finally go into that land. But, but he says in verse 15, it's a prophecy that Israel was to look for someone else. It says in verse 15 of Deuteronomy 18, it says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hearken. According to all that thou, ha thou, thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let, not, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see his great fire any more that I die not. The Lord, uh, and the Lord God said unto me, they have well spoken that, they, uh, the, that which they have spoken. I will raise up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee. And will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I command him, and it shall come to pass. Now, here's what Stephen didn't say, but if they know their Bible, it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So there's a prophecy that Israel, just like in, in all that reference to the, the mount, Israel scared death. The law scared them. Their Mount Sinai, Sinai shaking. They didn't want to, Moses, you go up to that mount. We'll just do, we'll just, whatever you come down and tell us, we'll do it. But we don't want to hear God's voice anymore. We're afraid. And God said, they were right to, to fear me. But Moses said, and God said to Moses there, that there's going to be another prophet like you raised up among the brethren. And they better hear him. 
Now, when it says, rather verse 15 or verse 18, from verse 15 it says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee like unto me. What did we just learn when Moses showed up? What did he do that made him so great among the nation of Israel? Signs and wonders. Did God raise up another prophet like unto Moses with signs and wonders? And don't forget where Stephen's going with this. Moses was raised up and on Mount Sinai he received the law that scared Israel to death. And they could never keep it. That's the whole reason that you're you're going to see them always judged off the land. But there's another prophet that came along that's going to provide for them the means of keeping God's law. Who's going to supply the Holy Spirit. Put holiness in them so that they can keep God's law and enter into that kingdom. The new covenant that the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to be like unto Moses, rather than give them the old covenant through Jesus Christ, is the new covenant. The imparting of the Holy Spirit upon the believing remnant, which is going to cause them to walk in his ways, keep his commandments, and be blessed of God. So Moses said a prophet's going to come, but God warned when he told Moses that, he said, they, if they won't hear that prophet, I will require it at him. This, this wrath that's coming is going to separate within the nation of Israel the believing remnant who goes into the land from the unbelievers who were going to perish from the land. And, and Stephen is, is warning them that this one is the Lord Jesus Christ. So he goes all the way to Moses and then he jumps to the Lord Jesus Christ. Go back to, to uh, Acts 7. And, and it's just good Bible study for you to look at verse 38 and learn something. A lot of times we call the dispensation of grace, I've heard people call it the, the church age. Bad terminology. See, the word church means called out assembly. Didn't God call a group of people out of Egypt? Yeah, that's Israel. And when he called them out of Egypt, they went into the wilderness, right? Verse 38, this is he which was... Uh, in the church in the wilderness, the assembly in the wilderness. This is a Jewish church. This is, the reason I say that is when Jesus Christ said in, in, in uh, ministering to Israel, and when Peter said that, you know, thou art the Christ, he said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus Christ is going to call out some people into the wilderness during that tribulation and there's going to be a church in the wilderness called out by Jesus Christ who will eventually be called, brought into the kingdom. That's, that's a Jewish assembly, a called out believe, uh, believers among the nation of Israel. Now, Paul calls us the church which is his body. And he tells us, we heard a good message on that yesterday, when he, the church which is the body of Christ, we're neither Jew nor Gentile. We're not a Jewish church. We're, we're a new creature in Christ. We're the church which is his body. God today, it, you'll read it later on in, in Acts chapter 15 where James is actually going to say, God did go out and visit the Gentiles to call out of them a people for his name. Are we called out? We're called out from whatever nationality we are to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and become a part of the body of Christ. We're a called out assembly, but we're the church which is his body. Israel, they were a church in the wilderness. They're going to be a church, a kingdom church. He's going to call them out and establish them, bring them into the land. That's why we call them the kingdom church. But anyhow, that's just the word church. Verse 38 of Acts 7. This is he which was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake unto him in Mount Sinai with our fathers who received the lively oracles and gave it to, unto us. Now, now watch, I'm, I'm going to read down to verse 53, uh, four, no, 53 43. And, and we're going to have to break this up in two parts. We can't, won't finish it today, but watch what happens here. Because this is, all of a sudden you, you catch, I mean, he's gone through a lot of detail. He's finally got them in the wilderness, but they're not in the land yet. Now watch what happens. To whom our fathers would not obey. So after Moses was going up to receive the mount, remember what they did while he was up there? They built a golden calf. Eventually, when they came to the edge of the land, to enter into the land, this is what they did. It says, To whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again to Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. 
For, for as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wrought not what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto idols and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifice by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch, the star of your God, Repham, figures which ye have made to worship them, and I will carry you beyond Babylon. Now, when you know, when you, in verse 42, you, you actually have, in verse 41, you got Israel worshiping the golden calf saying, let's not go into the land, let's go back to Egypt. Well, they did eventually go into the land, didn't they? The second generation, all that skipped. In fact, he starts, quote, Amos chapter 5, and I wouldn't have known that Israel in the wilderness, their sacrifices were idolatry to God, if Amos 5 didn't tell me that, that verse 42. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. Now, we'll look at those verses. That's why I asked you to hold Deuteronomy back in chapter 4. We'll go there next week, though. But anyhow, he gave them up to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye suffered... Uh, so, uh, offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness. Now that's Amos in the days, now that's Amos over here, in the days where he, Amos is prophesying about God giving them, kicking them off the land in the days of the kings, where we call, we call that the, the political fall of Israel, Babylon's going to carry them off the land. Amos is going back and quoting what's happening to Moses in the wilderness. And he's saying, you know, back there, they were, off, they were worshiping the host of heaven. And there were sacrifices they were, they were offering was to, to pagan gods. And, and then verse 43, Yea, they took up the tabernacle of Moloch, the star of their god, Repham, figures with, uh, which, he had made, which, which ye made to, to worship them, and I carried you away beyond Babylon. These two, these two time periods are linked together. Stephen spent all that time getting you to the wilderness, but not into the land. Now, we eventually you're going to get in the land the next couple verses, but he identifies this apostasy back here with the apostasy here for the point that Israel's about to make the same apostasy right here. And just like there was a fall of Israel, just like that generation didn't enter into the land, the second generation entered into the land. See the second? So there was a time in which when Israel was in the land, God kicked them out. Now Jesus Christ comes back and offers them the kingdom, and Israel is going to reject him like they did Moses the second time. Moses is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, isn't he? A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto me like a... a, a unto your brethren like unto me. Moses' birth, there's something went on in his birth, didn't he? They were killing babies. Didn't it happen the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, it's interesting. Moses actually was protected in Egypt. Where did, they, where did God preserve the life of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because Israel wasn't going to protect their Messiah. He went to Egypt. Then God brought him back in obscurity. Then when Moses was a full 40 years old, he thought people would know that it's time for their deliverance. Jesus, at 30 years old, shows up on the scene and says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. But Israel said to Moses, Who made you a, a, a ruler and a judge over us? And that's exactly what they said to the Lord Jesus Christ. But the second time Moses came back, after going away, he came back, he became a ruler and a judge and a deliverer for them. Jesus Christ is going to come back. And the believing remnant, he's going to be a ruler, he's going to be a judge, and he's going to deliver them, and they're going to be saved. So God raised up. We saw it in Joseph. We see it in, in, in uh, Moses. Now we're going to look at it in the time of the kings next week. So... I don't know why he didn't just, I don't, you know, he said those things, 
But you've got to look and look and look, and then you see it. <laughs> but boy, there's an awful lot of detail there in there. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the uh, ability to study uh, a Bible that covers all the history of man. Uh, at least Stephen's starting 2,000 years into history with Abraham. But Father, us Gentiles, we go all the way back before that. Our fall took place before Abraham. And all of us go back to our sin nature that came from Adam. We thank you, Lord, for sending your son to come into the world and die on the cross and not just deal with Israel's sins, but go all the way back and deal with the very sin of the world and die for all mankind and pay for our sins. And Father, I pray that, uh, that we won't squander this opportunity in grace, first to be saved and then to live for you um, as we look at Israel and see a testimony of them in their failure. Uh, Father, thank you that we can learn from their examples and pray that we do. And we thank you for the life that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity of being able to minister for you in the age of grace and all the while knowing that someday this age will end and you will bring to fulfillment those promises that you've made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to the nation of Israel. And we thank you. Uh, for the opportunity of seeing these things and being able to comprehend them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.